Chapter 3, Friends and Vultures Graduating into leadership, let's build a culture. Making meaningful connections on the road to success must include people as a primary resource. I hope the premise is clear now. It is true that sales come from the exposure of our business goods and services to customers to generate profits. Yet the true success comes when people are eager to help us make it happen. Hence, you need to revise your training on people management or get a crash course to help you perfect your strategy. It's not about beating the human resources department at their game, but about building your cult, yes, your faction, the people that will propel you up and beyond that ladder. Begin by studying your boss and his or her influence over your department. How much do people like the boss? I mean, is your environment stern or relaxed? Does it reflect the boss in his or her best form? There is a lesson to be learned in this as you take your time to move to the other departments, visit with friends, and collaborate on projects. We were anticipating a new move in my company's service offerings. As we worked on the project, we had created a set of business cards designed to differentiate these new initiatives from the traditional core of our branding. Somehow a friend came visiting and I showed him the new business cards, hoping to impress him. What we had done was to have a master business card that provided links to the new websites of the new services. Then we made a separate business card for each service. The idea being that top executives who supervise the entire operations will use a master to sell the new opportunities, while people working on specific assignments can use their respectively relevant business cards. My friend took a strong objection to the use of several business cards, insisting the one business card was good enough for all the five to seven services. All that we had to do was have the name, designation, and office of the individual on the front page of the card, and on the back page list the services that we are offering. In any case, the logo of the brand remains on the cards anyway. We tested the idea, and it turned out that our new design was stronger than the original one. It was less busy, and people can still associate the stronger brand with our new concepts. A culture is made, or destroyed, by its articulate voices. I'm Rod, the boss. Marketing managers in Wells Fargo had gone on rampage, raking up fake accounts and duping many people. The scandal that broke was so big that it took the exit of the well-loved John Stumpf, the CEO, to calm the waters. Stumpf saw the company through difficult times and made sure that Wells Fargo did not drown in the economic depression that required government intervention to rescue too big to fail financial institutions. The country had just started to breathe a little more comfortably when the Wells Fargo scandal broke. It sounded too unfair and unbelievable. However, the public outrage was so severe that every effort to assuage frayed nerves failed until Stumpf had to leave. Stumpf had to go because a generous perception was that he led a colony of dupes. How could he have missed out on such a highly prevalent practice? After all, your employees do your bidding, they follow your instructions. If fraud was so prevalent in the organization and nationwide too, how did it happen that no one suspected anything? Admittedly, there must be some cover-up somewhere, or the management was out of touch with its staff. Leadership had to change to repair the image of the company and confirm the promises about a new shift in strategy, and Stumpf lost his job. Simply put, the body reflects the head. The head owns and directs the organs that make up the organism. Mostly it's your setup and you bear the responsibility for all its actions. I worked in a company that had warehouses, storefronts, and office complexes. When managers had training conferences and similar meetups, you could see the differences in the dress patterns. Each group dressed up exactly as it would on a regular day. They wore whatever was familiar to their job environment. It is rare to see a manager from the warehouse wear a shirt. They would commonly be in some company t-shirt and almost always in jeans. The human resources people dress up in their high heels, while storefront managers may or may not be in heels but are always looking more relaxed, certainly in customer welcoming outfits. The guys are likely in white shirts with a tie. The guys from the IT wear shirts, certainly no ties or high heels, and indeed none of those shirts are cream nor not even near white. The point is that these generalizations reflect the cultures of their job spaces, each dress to suit their roles not because the company pays any group better than the other or because some groups outsmart the other, yet they mingle freely with each other. In my current department, everyone takes coffee or tea in the morning. 
Even the boss will clean the coffee maker and set up the next brew when needed. There is always a smile and a well wish for everyone he runs into at the department, every day and every time. So it is a relaxed small coven, unlike next door where everyone minds his or her own business. In the second department, I sat next to a colleague from the adjacent department for one year and never said more than good morning to her. I never knew her name. I found out that people will come from the second department to my own department just to chat and to ease some tension while pretending to go for some coffee. Never the other way around. So what is the picture that your boss has painted? Is an excellent exercise to sketch it or download an emoji to summarize a viewpoint because someone is going to do the same about you soon. Sourcing cult members. When we keep our radar up and notice the connections around us, we learn daily lessons on how to treat others. Mark Shaw and Brock. It's natural to look at trees and admire the beauty of its greenness. That beauty depends on years of successful cultivation that gave firmness to the roots as it sustained the branches of the tree. Those lush green leaves captivate the appeal of the beholder. Even biologists will allow themselves the luxury of a few minutes to relish the beauty of nature in this way. Mainly, most people are not concerned about the struggles and the history of the tree. For example, how it survived a wild bushfire or the potential target of being cut down for road construction, or how it extended the reach of its roots during a likely drought. Camping under such an excellent provision of nature and enjoying its freshness, the strength of its branches gladly promising a secure future is a source of bliss and beauty. Taking hold of and steering certain norms into standardization within one's organization creates loyalties that can become valuable engines of innovation in complex and dynamic organizations. Recognizing and manipulating these social forces is an art that must be adopted early in the game. The goal or even near future agenda may remain obscure to some of these loyalists depending on their roles and degree of trust, yet the progressive expansion of the cult must be an active process. A friend told me about his director. He noticed that the director always has these parties about once every three months to celebrate somebody or a season of the year or whatever. Over the years, he found out that in this crowd, there were always three managers who appear never to miss these parties, even though they had little to do with his department. He used to think that these people were some relatives of his director because he noticed the ease with which they flowed and occasionally seemed to help energize the parties. Then it happened that one of them had to retire, so stories got told. He realized that their bond was formed years ago as these managers, along with his director, had fun plotting their way up the company. Maybe alcohol had to do with it, but he learned enough that night to realize that these were mutual plotters. His director had been the most successful of the group, but they had over the years secured a following in which the company set up such that even though they started together in one company storefront, they are now fanned out heading various organs of this large conglomerate. Even in competition, they served accountability partners for each other. The least successful of the quartet was so because of her health issues. Even then, she had a role envied by many in the company. She naturally attracts a lot of people to herself because of her infectious, cheerful nature. This lady also managed a small department that handled employee access to discount and charity items. To be her friend is to secure access to insider details about upcoming discount events the company may be planning. More importantly, the juiciest ones to prepare for and the locations carrying the items. Indeed, being in his director's good books gives my friend potential access to secure reliable information about these deals should he or she have plans. Who doesn't have some idea for Christmas or Valentine's Day? Knowing what Christmas presents to put together in July is indeed a heads-off that anyone will appreciate, so by October you can begin to stack them up. It's about taking advantage of connections, no rules broken. Human nature inherently depends on relationships. These relationships are made and cemented through links or connections established through various types of responses. Making meaningful connections is a catalyst for reaching great heights in life because the quality of the relationships we form largely det determines the quality of the lives that we live. People may not understand that my friend's director has a community around him because of the distance of the characters with roles and departments, widely separated from each other in the overall organizational setup. Therefore, when specific faces always come together in parties or meetings or gatherings, or whatever setup it turns out to be, you must be alert that the relationship is beyond casual. 
These constant participants are leaders of sorts. If they become challenged in any way or have a demand, these leaders are the first point of contact because their connection creates some level of familiarity. Further, these clubs have rules. Their invitation means that you qualify to become a member. If there are significant differences in values and a fit cannot be established, either you reject the community or they kick you out. One of the two must happen. In fact, one of the two must happen. In fact, non-workplace social groups can help illustrate this better. For example, social media groups such as dating sites will be a good example. To secure a date is basic criterion for showing any interest in such a group. However, to consider joining, one will carefully review the requirements and practices of the group. Then upon participating, it is prudent to evaluate the methods to see if one's primary instincts will be in alignment with the language and feel of the interactions among members. There are other cliques where people of similar interests find a feeling and meet to pursue similar interests or investment options in clubs and other less formal meetups. It's human to flow through these sorts of rivers in ways that mainly appeal to our interests and to pursue them, digging more profound as we run into relationships that connect with our interests. In the workplace, the agenda is to make these local and global connections benefit the company through the various links established. These relationships are also catalysts for personal growth when properly exploited. Don't go to meetings to make or take notes only. There is always coffee time for chatting or clicking. <laughs>